Um, I have to thank the program committee for selecting this talk and you all for coming here to see something which is really offbeat, I think it's fair to say. And thank you to Venkat in his wonderful keynote yesterday and many others for talking about the joy of being outside the mainstream. I presume some of you have come to hear a bit about that. And I think I can promise you that the likelihood of APL becoming mainstream within the next decade is, is quite small. Two decades, I, I can't promise you, but uh, for 10 years, we're good. I should also apologize to you all in advance. I have, I'm going to run out of time. I have my, my brain and my heart are so full of things I want to tell you, and I only have an hour. So I need to justify that APL is a functional language and give you a brief introduction to, to you. Um, but hopefully enough of you will find it intriguing that maybe I'll get invited back next year to do a much more slower, slower talk, maybe even a workshop. Anyway, so APL has been outside the mainstream, I think, always. This is perhaps the most famous quote about APL that you'll find if you Google. Uh, Dijkstra was not impressed. Actually, if you visit these links, I'll be uploading my slides so you can follow these links. Um, he did have a more nuanced uh, feeling about APL, and you can read up about that. But I mean, really, this is about learning how to read, right? So um, there's parts of this statement that I really like. <laughs> you, you may be surprised I decided to keep this last one as something that I see as positive. And I think we heard yesterday also that you know, laziness is good. The right kind of laziness is good. And I think APL, hopefully you, you will be convinced, APL helps you do more with less effort. Now, since it's, it's been such a long time since APL was invented, I think it's probably worth spending a little time talking about the history. In fact, the inventor passed away already in 2004, and that's not because he, was, uh, he died young. He was 84, Ken Iverson, when he died. And as you can see, his path into computing and mathematics, of course, this was very early days, so everybody's path was a bit strange in those days. But he actually grew up on a farm, uh, you know, of Norwegian descent farmers in Alberta, Canada. And he finished the, the one-room school and went to work on the farm. But fortunately for him, one could say, he was drafted by the Canadian Army. And he completed high school in the Army. And in fact, his service mates told him that there was this thing called university. And after they had seen his love for mathematics, he he really enjoyed teaching his, his soldiers mathematics. One of his mates, in fact, told him if he didn't go to university after he left the service, he was going to come and beat him up. So Iverson went to university, Queen's University in Canada, and continued to do his doctoral work at Harvard because he graduated uh, top of his class in Canada. Worked with some fairly high-powered people, later Nobel uh, laureates on economics, did work on mathematics, matrix math mathematics. He taught mathematics at Harvard, but he found it very frustrating. He found mathematical notation quite frustrating. And when Harvard decided that he wasn't good enough for them, he left and went to IBM, where he continued to work on what was Iverson notation, called it a programming language. Uh, and IBM, after he had used it for teaching and modeling complex systems for many years, finally an interpreter for the language was developed. So the language actually existed on paper and on the blackboard and was used for teaching before it became a programming language. The first APL interpreter in 66. Uh, and I yeah, those are the important things on that slide. And Ken Iverson received the Turing Award in 1979 for his work on APL and educational uses of, of the language. So a little bit about me. As you might see from this picture, it's supposed to indicate that I also have some Norwegian roots, if you recognize the flag. And I'm a cyclist. Um, my, parent, my mother's Norwegian, my father's South African. I live in Denmark and work in the UK, so I'm really a mixed kid. I'm really pleased to be here. I was born in the same year that Iverson's book was published, so I feel uh, there's some destiny there. But I started out doing the, you know, the usual things. I tried to solder. I soldered all of these components onto a board and nearly got them to work. But fortunately, two years later, I was rescued 
uh, I met APL. And since then, I've actually been doing noth nothing else much. I did write one program in a whole bunch of different languages, but none of them caught my fancy. Yeah, so I've been doing APL perhaps since before most of you were born. And I'm a failed academic. I have the first year of math and computer science from three different universities, in fact. But uh, working with APL has worked quite well for me. And for the last 10 years, I've been the CTO of this company called Dialog, which is an APL vendor. So be warned that I sell APL, right? That's my job. Dialog, the company, is the youngest APL of the APL vendors. Um, it's only 35 years old. We released version one of our product in 1983 on Unix. Today, we deliver it on a variety of platforms. The latest one is the Raspberry Pi, where there's a free version, if you're interested in that. We're moving on to the Mac and Android and other platforms, I think, will follow, although they're not typical analytical platforms, perhaps, which is where the sweet spot for APL is. So we definitely haven't crossed the chasm yet. We had slow growth for 25 years. We now have what we call rapid growth. But if you look at Bruce's curve, we're still down, down here. Although you could argue APL actually had a, a wave on the mainframes in the, in the 70s and 80s, came down again. And now I think we're seeing uh, changes in the way people want to do programming, which means APL is becoming more relevant again. So I'm not sure that sine wave only has one top. At least that's what I'm betting on. So returning to, to Iverson's story, what really frustrated him was he looked at mathematics and there were all these completely different syntaxes for expressing different things in mathematical notation. So not just that the syntactical forms were, were very varied, but the precedent rules would, you know, uh, if you put A, B, C next to each other, that might mean different things depending on whether one of them was a, a trigonometry, you know, one of them was pi, you might decide to multiply it before, and so on and so forth. And when you started to deal with matrices, which Iverson got involved with, things got a lot worse. So he came up with this new notation, which is very much simpler. I don't know. I hope you can read that at the back. Otherwise, if you're interested, uh, move forward. So the syntax of APL is extremely, there are only a very small number of forms. Either you can have a function, a prefix, and an argument. So for example, iota, which is the index generator 6, returns 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Or you can have a function, a left and a right argument. So 1, 2, 3 times 10, 1, 10, 20 gives you a vector back. So multiplying three lists, a map is implied in APL. APL doesn't have uh, functions as first-class citizens, but it has things called operators. The slash here is something which takes a function as an argument. So slash is reduce. This is a times reduce. And that gives you a derived function which multiplies the elements together. You can also have dyadic operators. So an operator which takes two functions and derives a function which takes one or two arguments. In this case, it's the vector product. So it's the plus reduction of multiplication mapped. But in APL, that's completely general. You can apply any function there. And then there's indexing, which is sort of seen as a rather non-functional syntax, but is very useful. And in it, one of the things that's important in APL is that you can index with an array. So this is selecting four items out of a list of characters in one go. And of course, you can name all the various parts. You can name arrays. You can name derived functions. You can name operators in the latest release uh, that we just put out. You couldn't do that. Well, the operator is reduce. Yeah. Yeah. So it's 1 times 1 plus 0 times 2 plus 2 times 3. So it's a vector product yeah, in one shot. It's, it's the classical vector multiplication in APL is written uh, from mathematics is written plus dot times. But of course, you can put any function there. And if I don't run out of time, we might see some examples of that. OK, I'm not going to have time to show you this live. But the, up here, this is tryapl.org. So if you want to play around, there's an online REPL that you can go to. And it includes 
In this case, I've hovered over the question mark here with my cursor, and it pops up the help and shows you the monadic, which is the prefix. We use the term monadic. We, sorry, we started using that before monads became popular. And dyadic is the infix where we have two arguments. And you can see there's a whole bunch of mathematical functions. There are structural functions, reshape, catenate, catenate on the first dimension, reverse, transpose, take, drop, enclose, depth. Um, and we'll see some of these sorting, searching. But this is basically all you need to learn. And this is the entire language right here. Uh, and when you're working in the REPL, you have those symbols available that you can hover over. OK. So what did Iverson do? Ah, we don't have time to wait for all these animations. He lined them all up, and then with his new notation, sort of this is what guided the design of his notation, he found that he could say, well, AB is A times B. E to the X is the monadic power. So if you don't have a left argument, it's E to the power. That one's obvious. B logarithm, so this is the exponentiation symbol with a circle around it. And you can see it looks like a log that's been chopped over from one end. There's a lot of that kind of mnemonic symbolism in the choice of the symbols in the language to make it easier to learn. Square root is a to the power reciprocal n. Mat vector product, matrix product, those are all the same. If it's a matrix, it takes the rows on the left and the columns on the right and repeatedly applies the, the math reduce. Fgx is Fgx. F plus G of X is F plus G of X in the latest release. This is something that's just been added in the last decade or so. Tangent is the third trigonometric function squared. These two forms, the plus reduction of four times iota six is the sigma, and the times reduction is the, the big pi. And this one here, okay, I don't have room there for that, but it's the um, 2A divided into minus b plus catenate minus. Uh, so that executes both the plus and the minus um, between these two parts. Square root of b squared minus 4ac. So you can see for somebody who's coming from a mathematical background, translating formulas into APL and starting to do work with data is, uh, should be quite easy. And it's much more... This is really the origin of the, of the name of the language. You have to remember that Iverson was a mathematician and he was looking for something that would allow him to express steps in a mathematical, um, right? it's a terrible name today because people compare it then to classical mainstream programming languages and they say, no it isn't. Okay, so fundamental rules, they're very, very few. There's only one data type, the array, you could say that's Actually, there's numbers and characters. But for, if for us, the numbers are everything from a Boolean, so true, false is zero and one, all the way up to complex numbers. APL will just promote the type as, as required. Characters is now everything in Unicode. Or any item of an array could be another nested array. So you can nest these things. And note that a single number is also an array. It's just a zero-dimensional array, right? A vector has one dimension. A single number has, has no dimension. As we've seen for most primitive functions, map is implicit. All functions are either prefix or infix. That's it. You can have one or two arguments. All operators are postfix or infix. And there's a very nice interaction between the fact that functions are in fix, oh, sorry, prefix and operators are postfix, which really makes the, is what makes the language work in my account. The order of execution, people say it's right to left because this, Iverson selected this sort of as the predominant sort of the, the classical syntax from mathematics. F, G, H chains the data. That's a chain of function applications going from right to left. Okay, there was a little star up here that says where I said our arrays are immutable. That was true until we added object orientation and you could put object references into an array. So you could have something in the middle of an array which is a reference to a .NET collection. And of course, that's not a value type. So once you start playing with objects, the immutability goes away. But 
that's probably not a big surprise. Okay, so enough slides to begin with. Um, let me try and show you some of this in action. Okay, so I'm, right, so first thing, the lamp, this symbol is the comment symbol. You see, it's a picture of a lamp. It illuminates the code. APL is interactive, okay? So basically, the way you use APL is you sit here in this REPL, and that's been how it's been since 1966. This is not a recent invention. It was always like that. One, two, three, plus four, five, six, math is implicit. And, you know, multiplication is the same. Here's a prefix function, so exclamation mark prefix is factorial. Uh, with two arguments, it becomes the binomial the gamma function. And here's, I inserted this after seeing the keynote yesterday. So here's, it's not all numbers. You can have uh, an array of character vectors, and we can find Nemo. I need to box this here because otherwise it would be a, a four element vector at too high a level to compare to the list of, of vectors. I can also reverse it and say which of the elements of names are a member of Nemo. But of course really finding Nemo is this function. So we saw the iota which was to generate the numbers from one to n. In the dyadic case, it's where in the left argument will you f do you find this thing. So Nemo is in the fourth position in this argument. Sorry? Yes, APL, well actually, uh, I didn't want to talk about that. You can switch the index origin to zero. And of course, everybody who's programmed in assembler or C or anything like that wants to do that. Um, APL is really, the people who are most successful with APL are people that are any kind of engineer other than a software engineer. <laughs> and I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> the people who became millionaires writing their own software in APL typically didn't have a software engineering background. So chemical engineers, financial <coughs> engineers, and so on. Um, if you look at Excel, R, a number of tools that are sort of aimed at that community, they, they are index origin one. Of course, once you include a .NET object in one of your arrays and you start indexing it, it's doing the indexing, um, and you end up with a horrible combination of, of index origins. But that's, that's what happens when you do interop. So here's the list. You want to double the list by now. I guess this is no surprise. You multiply it by two. So the, the, the rigmarole here, the, the, you know, there's not a lot of... Uh, procedure and protocol. Okay, so here's a nasty example just to highlight the, the syntax. You probably weren't expecting minus two. Okay, APL has to use a high minus, a different symbol for to show the sign than the function because otherwise the syntax would be ambiguous as I think it is in many other programming languages. But this is essentially that you have to put the parentheses in like that. So it's 10 divided by five, it's minus two and not what you might expect. And I mean, Iverson's reasoning for that is just, once you have 30 or 40 functions, the idea of having a precedence is just stupid. You know, nobody can remember it. Um, most functions have a both, as, as we said, prefix and infix. Typically, there's a relationship between the, the prefix and infix. The um, prefix will be, maybe have a, a fixed left argument like in, with uh, exponentiation. So generally, read from left to right, but execute from right to left. Is, is, uh, and I'll show you an example of that. So functions and operators, plus reduce. I'm, I'm going to have to go really fast here. Plus scan. So this is um, uh, where you get the partial result. So 1, 1 plus 2 is 3. 1 plus 2 plus 3 is 6. And the final sum is 10. So you can generate all of those in, in one go, which is quite useful. Um, I think there's a typo. I really only wanted to show you this. So the vector product, we've already seen that. I'm repeating myself. And of course, it works with characters as well and other functions. So this is are any, the or reduction of equals. So are any of the characters the same here? 
And so it's the or reduction of this one zero zero and yes, one of them is one of them is the set. And I keep hitting the wrong key here. Okay, we've talked about that. So here's a user-defined function. Square root is omega is the right argument. Alpha is the left argument, if there is one. So here's the square root function. And because it's using a function which is, in fact, both shape and rank invariant, you could pass it a seven-dimensional matrix. It would still work. Um, so we're sort of allergic to types in a way, although I do realize that types have, have their uses. We do have customers with a 50 million lines of code who would really like some static type checking of their application. Okay, so here's Pythagoras. It's the square root of the plus reduction of alpha and omega to the power two. So we're doing a map reduce um, there. And I can do, you can also do, um, you can use user-defined functions anywhere that you could use a primitive function. So I can do a plus dot Pythagoras. So that does the Pythagoras map and then the plus reduction and adds all these numbers up, giving us 16 at the, at the end there. Okay, so even something like roll, you know, generating random numbers, you have a function which takes an array as the right argument. So I'm rolling four dice. Reshape is a very useful function that creates an array of the shape given on the left. So that's 10 dice. So I can roll 10 six-sided dice. I hope nobody's offended by rolling dice. You have to be careful. Um, and if you don't like the squiggles, then of course you can, you can rename them, right? You can just do an assignment if that makes you feel happy to begin with. You, you won't feel happy with it after a while because Naming these things actually makes, in my opinion, and the opinion of, I think, most people who become experienced with this, makes, makes the code much harder to read. One of the great things about APL is that it has no reserved words. So generally, you can rely on the fact that anything that has a name like this is your code. And anything that's a squiggle is part of the, the underlying language. Okay, so we'll make some throws. And we changed random number generator in the last release, and uh, I have no fives now in this demo. But I'll show you that one of the nice things about Booleans being numbers is that I can apply a plus reduce to a Boolean array. So I can easily say, well, how many throws had the value five? So Booleans are not outside the domain. Well, we don't really have Booleans. We have one byte integers. So here's an outer product, so the null dot equals. That takes each item here, gives you a row for each one, and then you have the comparison. So if I wanted to count, oh, I, I name iota here. So count to six, so I can write sum, count to six, outer product equals throws, and I get the count of ones, twos, and so on. And I can do a million of them. And you see it's pretty fast because although this is an interpreted language, it's pretty close to being bytecode. I mean, there's no interpretation really going on here. It's just, it's bytecode as you write it, despite being, I would claim, a very human-friendly notation. Now, in the last release of, of APL, that example also became sort of irrelevant because we introduced a new operator called key. The symbolism there is you, it's like a SQL group by, so you have a table here and it's, it's grouping things. So if I generate a million random numbers between one and six, and then I say apply the function alpha, which the key, the unique key is given as the left argument, and the data items corresponding to that key are given as the right argument. So I say return the key and the count of the items for each distinct key, and I get this. So this is the equivalent to select key, comma, sum, count, key um, in SQL. Okay. So I think I will, since I not unexpectedly used too much time, I will uh, move back to the slides for a moment. Um, right, so I made the claim, uh, I think once you get some experience with APL, although it executes from right to left, you would generally read it from left to right. 
Um, so you can read this here, which is the transcription of that as 2 times a divided into minus b plus or minus the square root of the determinant b squared minus 4ac. And if an APL expression can't be used in that way, you should probably break it up because it's supposed to be, I mean, APL was invented as a mechanism for communicating between humans, which happens to be very nicely executable. So, um, yeah, we're not just trying to jump on the bandwagon here, although this is the first appearance of APL probably at a functional language conference for, for some time. John Backus recognized in 77 in his Turing Award lecture that Ken Iverson had in fact created a lot of the basis for what became functional programming. He did go on to say some things, um, you know, there's not enough functional forms in APL and he really wasn't happy about the fact that it wasn't pure. You can very easily step into a procedural mode in APL if you want to. I think today it's sort of recognized that multi-paradigm is really where you need to be. Um, so what we say to describe dialogue APL today, which is really some, has moved a very long way since 1977, is that dialogue is an array-first multi-paradigm programming language. So we're claiming that array programming is a paradigm like functional programming. Uh, we have, we support functional object-oriented and imperative programming based on an APL kernel. So sort of to, to prove my functional credentials to you, I have a bit of Rosetta code here that one of our team who, who does scheme set up for me. So map FA is just FA because most of the time map is, uh, is implicit. For the functions that are not scalar, that don't just map automatically, user-defined functions, for example, there's an operator called each, which is the equivalent of map. So you can explicitly map things. Filter, the compress, oh, this symbol actually is overloaded. That's a bit unfortunate, but it was done back in 1966 before the distinction between functions and operators was properly understood. Uh, if you have a Boolean array on the left and you compress an array, that selects the items where the left argument is true. And we've seen fold right. Um, so the classical staple diet of functional programming. So juxtaposing things creates lists in APL, or there's a catenate function if you want to do it. Actually, this was extremely controversial in APL, the fact that there's a the space is a function here, essentially. Uh, so bad that, in fact, I, Iverson more or less quit his job at IBM when IBM decided to put this into an APL 2 in 1983. Yeah? You have to know at runtime what X and Y are. If X was a function, that would be a function application. If it was two functions, it would be a function composition. If it's two arrays, yeah, I mean, it's both beautiful and horrible at the same time. <laughs> yeah? You need, you need to take care. Um, I think I'm, I'm, you know, I'm at heart, I'm with, I'm with Iverson. I'm now the CTO of a company that in, has an interpreter that implements this. Um, it, it, it makes code very, very simple to write in a lot of cases but it makes it more ambiguous. In many ways, it's more of a problem for us than for the users because writing a, sorry? Yes, and writing a compiler is a, is a nightmare. Yes, it could, it could, yeah, 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 it's true. But, um, but the problem is to avoid that, you have to introduce a lot of syntax and protocol that, that I feel distracts really from, uh, you know, then you no longer have a mathematical notation, certainly. You have something which is programming. Um, yeah. So you can take and drop um, vector and matrix products, you know, lots of code in, in scheme and in APL we've seen it's just, you know, whether it's the vector case or the matrix case and whether the functions are plus times or and dot equals or dot equals or transitive closure and dot or, or dot and, sorry. Uh, you have a completely general mechanism. We saw the outer product, the Cartesian product. 
So here I'm doing a null dot maximum. And uh, this thing is called commute because it reverses the arguments. But when there's only one argument, we now call it the selfie operator because it f selfie x is x f x. So if I want to do the null dot maximum with iota 6 on both sides, I just say null dot maximum selfie iota x. And I get this thing where I have, where it's symmetrical around uh, the diagonal, right? Um, other dialog operators, well, we saw scan. We've talked about commute, which is selfie when there's no left argument. It copies the left argument, the right argument to both sides. We have function power, so that says apply the function. If there's a number on the right, it applies it some number of times. So uh, 0 0.5 times omega power 3 would halve the argument three times. But if the right operand, in this case, is match, which is the whether the arguments are identical, then it applies the function until the, ne well, the one invocation and the it passes the one invocation and the previous invocation, the results, to this function. And if it returns true, that's the end of the iteration. So power match is the fixed point. So repeat this until it stops changing. So if you do 1 plus the reciprocal of omega power match 1, it computes the golden ratio by repeatedly applying this uh, expression. Rank. Um, so where normally the map is done on scalars, you take one scalar item at a time and apply the function. There's an operator to control that. So you can say, I want to take a vector on the left and apply it to a matrix on the right. Or in this case, use ravel, which is when it's monadic, it removes the shape of an array. So no matter how many dimensions it has, it becomes a vector. So if you say ravel rank two, it collapses the last two dimensions of a matrix into a single one. Key we saw, and then an experimental thing in the latest version of APL, dialog APL, is a parallel operator. So that derives a function which puts your function, puts f inside an isolate, which is a sort of a closed space, executes it, and returns a future which you can wait on uh, when you need it. But your, your ex the execution of your main program carries on until you need this result. So that's sort of our concurrency model, if you like. Um, unfortunately, because the APL community has, at least until recently, been very isolated, you know, we've, we've been our own little trickle, uh, independent from the mainstream for a very long time. I don't know the right terminology to tell you guys which of the concurrency models that we know that this corresponds to, but maybe somebody. I asked that question in the fishbowl yesterday, but I didn't get an answer. Um, also, in the latest release, we have a number of point three forms. So we, we saw that f plus g is the way to express, well, f plus g. So if you have three functions next to, juxtaposed like this, f, g, h. So if it's a monadic function, it's f of omega, g, h of omega. And if it's dyadic, then it's the it's called fork because you have essentially this is the root and then you have three or a fork going up to the functions on the right hand side. Um, so it applies the left function to the arguments, the right function to the arguments, and then it applies the root function to those results. So you might think, well, why is that useful? Well, it has a lot of useful applications. So for example, f plus g is an example of that. If you have two functions, you can just write them like this. It applies f. It applies G and it adds the result. And you can compute the average, or you can define the function mean or average by saying it's the sum divided by the count, which is the mathematical definition of the average. So this is going to count the number of items in the, in the argument. This is going to sum it, and then the two will be divided. So the number of applications for this is, is surprisingly large once you get used to it. And of course, the interpreter can really optimize uh, uh, you know, that kind of stuff. And when you write a compiler, writing a compiler for these things is really, really easy because it's all pre-parsed, basically. You just, you just execute. Two functions is an atop. So 
uh, floor divide would be integer, div integer division rounding down. Uh, then we have sort of classical composition, so I can bind one argument, in this case 32 composed with plus is a function that adds 32. Multiplication composed with 1.8, um, so Fahrenheit is add 32 composed with scale. Uh, and we talked about the fact that you can also curry, well actually we didn't talk about curry, we talked about the power operator and fixed point. And one thing you can do in recent versions of ACL is that you can curry the right operand of an operator giving you a monadic operator. So fixed point would be power max, and then you get a monadic operator that you can apply any function to. Um, one of the, another really interesting thing about that really colors the way people use ACL, yeah? Well, any keyboard, you just you, you can define whether you want to use the control or the alt key or the windows key to map the symbols to, to the keyboard. And in the, in the REPL, you have them all up here. When you hover over them, it will tell you, um, it'll tell you, yeah, you can't really see that for you sitting at the front. So it tells you where it is on the keyboard plus the definition of it. So while you're learning it, there's, there's a lot of help available. Um, but that's true, it takes a little bit of getting used to. But you know, anybody who's productive is touch typing anyway. You're not, you're not looking at the keyboard when you write code, right? Hopefully. Um, well, I don't know. Maybe that was a bit prejudiced. Okay, so because map is implied, and because indexing can be done with arrays, you can write a lot of logic where you would expect to write if statements uh, as parallel expressions. So for example, if I have this data here, a vector, 2, 7, 15, 60, and I want to make sure that none of the items are less than 5. So I simply want to say, if data sub i is greater than 5, then keep it, otherwise give me 5. I can just write that as data max 5. So no loops, no conditionals. Now it gets maybe a little bit weirder. So I want to increment data if it's 3, 7, or 15. So I can write that as data plus. Actually, I don't need one times here. That's uh, if I wanted to increment it by more than one, I would have put something here. I could just have said data plus data element 3, 7, 15. That would give me a Boolean vector, we call it, and the ones would be added. So I increment each element which has that. And then there's sort of the classical switch statement here. I say I want, I have two arrays, x and y. I want to select and I have a flag vector of the same length as both. Um, I want to select x where the flag is true and y where the flag is not true. I can write that as x times flags plus y times not flags. And that might seem like it's, we're doing more work this way, right? We're multiplying everything by a Boolean and so on. But that's very, very highly optimized, and of course, the compiler can optimize that very, very easily. And these expressions are all very easily parallelizable, is really important. So writing a parallel compiler that knows how to do this stuff in parallel is quite easy. So here's an example of doing sort of bucketing. I have four values, and I have my ages, and I want to select one of these values. I do the division rounding up, in this case, by 10. And then I make sure that it's at least one and no more than four, and I select from that array. Um, let's see. Mm, yeah, I'm running out of time. So I think I, I won't talk much about this. We've seen a lot of these forms already. You can write functions, user-defined functions in this functional form. There's also a procedural form, which I won't show you, because this is a functional Alpha is the left argument and omega is the right argument. So yeah, you can only have two. Functions are either prefix or infix. Of course, they can be tuples, right? They can be nested arrays, uh, but they can't have different names. You can only have one name, yeah. So that, that's sort of a weakness, uh, admit it. But the elegance of everything being infix or, or prefix allows the construction of these big functional 
No, you can. Yeah, but you don't. You don't have to. And if I don't run out of time, I'll show you an example where I do exactly that. Yeah. So I think I'll, I'd like to push on. Um, here's so here's a multi-line function with a guard. So this is a recursive Fibonacci mm -hmm. definition. You know. So we start by default. If there's no left argument, we start with zero and one. If the right argument is zero, we just return the head of the of the left argument. Otherwise, we sum the elements in the left argument and we drop one and we do a recursive tail call. Tail calls are optimized in this language. Uh, and you can see you can have guards in this, uh, this functional style of writing ACL as well. Okay, so. Ooh, 19 minutes to go. Okay, so this is going to be really fast because I have too much stuff to show you here. But I'm, I'm trying to give you a f what I'm trying to do is really give you a flavor of what it's like to work in this language. Don't you know? Don't expect to be able to follow these examples. I would be amazed if anybody could. <laughs> um, but hopefully the flavor is coming across. So here's a little function I've written called Wikipedia, which takes an argument of a page name from Wikipedia, and if I say and it's called cached get because I didn't know whether I would have an internet connection. So I actually have a variable in my workspace with all the data. And uh, it gets it from there if there's no internet connection. So I got some HTML, which fortunately is XHTML. And then I've written a little function called table one because I want to generate some names for a demo. Um, and I found this page on Wikipedia, list of the most common surnames in Asia. I thought I'd try and make it relevant. And it's got lots of tables in it, right? So I r I'm writing a little DSL here. So table one returns the contents of the first table in this page. And now I'll risk blowing your minds away here with some a bit too much code. So what I'm doing is I'm taking this XHTML, you know, long vector of text. We have a function called quad XML, which turns this into a, a nested array with five columns. The first column is the level of nesting. The second column is the name of the tag. The third column is the data. And then the, um, the fourth column is the attributes and so on. And uh, so I'm going to look in the second column for the first occurrence, for all the occurrences of table. And I'm going to do a plus scan. So I get 0, 0, 0, 1 when I get to the first table, 2 when I get to the next table. And then I search for the number that I'm looking for. So what's the location of the nth table in this vector? Then I look for items following that which are all more deeply nested than this tag that I found. And then I index out of the array. So now I have, I have, these are all the HTML tags that correspond to the first table. And so I then look for all TD and THs and I just find the indices of those because that's where the data is. I then count how many THs I have, because I, I, this is really screen scraping, right? This will not al always work, but that's how many columns I have in the table. And then I do a division rounded down, which gives me how many rows I have. And then I found when I sort of inspected this, it took me about an hour to write this function, I discovered that some of these THs have, don't contain any data, they just contain an anchor, and the data is actually in that. So, you know, this is really hacking. I just said, well, to the index, add one if the next tag is an A. And then I've, I've got my matrix of, of data back. Um, and then I wrote a function called column. So this is, sort of, this is very typical for how end users might work with it. They're essentially building their own little DSL as they go along. And the, s the fact that the functions are all infix or prefix really aid helps, I think, is fundamental, in my opinion, to making these a little bit like natural language without having to do any magic. So I can get the romanization column out of this. Uh, so column and columns are two little functions like that. I'm not going to explain them because I'm running out of time. So I'm going to get romanization from table one. I'm going to get Bangla romanization from table two. And I've got this vector and I discovered, ah, oh, there's some of them with slashes in them. So I had to write a little function called first word, which drops everything after the first space or slash or comma. And then just to show that I did a very unfunctional thing here. I, I mutated this surname thing. Horrible, bad me. 
Uh, but I, of course, I can write a little helper function that is column alpha of table omega and apply it with those two arguments and get the whole thing back in, in one shot. Okay, so there's all my surnames. And then I got the given names and this, I don't have time to show you that, but essentially I'm doing the same stuff. And I got a bunch of given names. And then I want to generate lots of data of people's names. So I give them all initials from A to Z. I'm just catenating to the list of letters to each one dot full stop. And now I can say, well, take initials and do an outer product with catenation of the surnames. I get a 26 by 39 array with all the combinations. And then I can take all the given names and I put a space between the given name and the initials. I'm doing another outer product and I have a 64 by 26 by 39 array of all the combinations of given names, initials, and surnames. And then I ravel it and I count how many people's names I've generated, 64,000. Um, I just pick 50,000 of them at random. And then, yeah, I don't have time to explain this, but basically I take the base, oh no, I will explain that. So the base two logarithm of the number of people is 15. So I take random numbers between two and 15 and I use those as exponents. So I raise two to the power of that, two to the power of this, and then I generate random numbers from that again. So I get a roughly logarithmic distribution of the number of friends. So I've got a number like this. And oops. And then I generate, I take for each of these numbers here, I do a, a deal with this as the left argument. So I create this number of random numbers for each one of those 50,000 people. It takes about, I think, five seconds on my laptop. There's a serious amount of random number generation going on, and it's a deal, so I have to make sure I'm not getting duplicates and so on. So that's, that's a fair amount of work. And then I don't want people to be friends with themselves, so I have this without, and then the, the index of each person. So the first person is this guy. He has these friends, and I can use that to index. I said uh, people indexed by one from friends. So I get the names of these people if I want to generate a nice application. Um, count how many friends I have after removing themselves from the friends list. So I generated a, a total of 100 million friends connections between 50,000 uh, uh, people. Um, and I can now do something like, well, compute the average number of friends. Ah, the mouse was up there. I can compute the maximum, the average, and the minimum. So I, I'm playing around with this data is really what, what the impression I, I want to give you here. I can find somebody who's lonely, look to see somebody who has only one friend. So that's Ahmed Pal for some reason. Um, and then I've written a function here, which I really would have liked to have more time to, sh to, to talk to you about, but I have run out of time. Hopefully I've given you a flavor. So basically there's a function here that recursively goes through, um, so it finds out who, who this person can reach. It creates a Boolean array filling in the ones where they have friends. And then you recursively go through looking at their friends again, so reachable in each, um, iteration through the um, recursive call is you, you compress the friends by the ones which, which have been reached, which gives you the next group of friends. So after I've recursed on this four times, I have the, uh, the distance to every one of the 50,000 people from that person. And I can use key to say, well, how, what's the distribution of those? Well, I have 49,520 people who are four hops away, 477 who are three hops away, and so on. And um, yeah, I can compute the path. It's a function very similar to that one there and find out who are the people on this path and you know, play around with data. The point is here, you know, if you sat down and you knew, you thought about this a lot, you would probably just sit down and write the code. But 
the, the process I'm trying to give you an idea about here. Somebody who doesn't, hasn't really thought about it, he's got some data, you know, it's probably a more complex example than this. And he's messing about with the data. I haven't written really much functions yet. I wrote a 10 line function, but I'm exploring this space, right? And um, yeah, I'm out of time. So 10 minutes, right. Oh. So just to show you, I'm starting a web server here written in APL. And just to show you that you, know, you can build applications with this stuff. One minute on that. Um, ah. Okay. It crashed. It always happens when there's 10 minutes to go. And I'll go to, so here's my web application. And it's a tag cloud, so it just has 10 friends and it shows, it's using uh, tag cloud, which is a control from a company called Syn Sync Fusion, you know, one of the latest and greatest things. So it's a tag cloud is something which gives you these words related to, this, to a size of something. So basically it's the number of friends that they have and I can click on one of these, and it takes me on just to that person that I've clicked on. This sort of educational web server that we have here is one where if you click on the logo at the top, this is our conference logo from two weeks ago at our user conference, you can see the code that was written for this. So we have our, here's our little code that generates the friends matrix. So this is really the APL application code down here. And the rest of it is just the code to generate that web page where we say, well, give me an H2, which says friends tag cloud. Give me a link, an anchor to reset it. Add a tag cloud, a sync fusion control. And then there's a little bit of logic depending on whether you've selected a user or not. And then basically just set the properties on this tag cloud object and, and it's rendered uh, in JavaScript. Okay, so with eight minutes to go. The, the sweet spot for this technology is still, as I think it has always been, people doing financial software. So the, the big users are companies today that make software, typically asset management systems where there's a lot of numerical data that needs to be crunched. And it's really important to be able to read legislation in the morning and start simulating new products that you might sell uh, in the afternoon. And of course, the key thing about APL is it allows people to do that. You might, you, when you build a large application, of course, you do want software engineers in the process, but you can leave the nasty business logic. You can actually let the people who understand it code it themselves, and then you can review uh, what they've done. There's also some uh, non-financial users. Um, they don't dominate, but some of them are very large, uh, like uh, the world's largest, I think, electronic patient journal system in Sweden. And Exxon Mobil uses this to uh, optimize how they track petroleum products. And uh, this is not a large application. This is just something, there's a customer of ours in Finland who won um, a prize last year for building this application in APL. So I'd like to show you a video now. Wait a bit of my precious time. Can you turn up the sound? Maybe I can do that. So this is an APL application.
card already in the uh, the code generator for the uh, graphics card that you was running on your Mac and the Cuda board or whatever. I said I think really cool and, and quite different from the other applications uh, that were on the list there. So where have we been? Well, I've actually, we can maybe skip over this slide because I've talked about most of it already. But, you know, it's uh, the people who tend to get attracted to APL are technology averse. And the APL market really took 10 years to discover that the PC wasn't just one of these silly fads that was going to go away again. Uh, and the companies who sold APL were very badly hurt in that process. Um, and then we had the sort of really dark ages for APL where everybody wanted to move to C++ and the GUI APIs were changing so quickly that we couldn't really provide our users with the kind of covers that they expect as, as relatively non-technical people. But we really feel that the, the focus on arrays and functional programming, concurrency, big data, uh, APL applications tend to be very lean in terms of the data uh, arrays that you create. So the arrays are very, very compact, uh, and ver the functions are very, very highly optimized. And we're somewhere in the middle of this range, so uh, still. Uh, so to successfully use APL, my recommendation is you need to find the right mix of domain experts and software engineers for your application. You're going to need both. You might not need the software engineers for the first few weeks, but you will need them eventually. Be pragmatic, you know, use objects. If you must, if you saw the source code of that web page, which was the only there for a split second, that was a class. It started with something saying colon class. It had a constructor and so on. Because I think for user interfaces, a lot of user interfaces, I think object orientation remains a good tool of thought. And that's the thing that's important to, to focus on. And for in the fishbowl yesterday, we were asked, well, you know, what's the next big thing? And I think the next big thing after concurrency is simply complexity. The data that we're going to be asked to analyze and work on is just going to get really, really hard to work with. And if you don't have tools with the kind of expressive power that APL has, maybe it's not going to be APL, maybe something new that, you know, embodies what APL does in, in, a, in a different framework will be more successful. But I, I really believe that this is true. This is from a colleague of ours who has a, an array-based language derived from APL. This, this is true. And uh, yeah, I don't think we need to talk about that. There's a list of major language extensions. You've seen some of them. You can look at the slides. I'll upload them. We still have a whole bunch of work to do. Um, we don't have a compiler or types. Those are getting important for large, large applications. We don't have closures or lazy evaluation. We do recognize that we need those. But you know, after 50 years, you know, where was the automobile after 50 years of invention? I think computing is still sort of in roughly in that place in its history. It's going to be another 50 years before we've really figured out how to write software. If you were slightly intrigued by this, Unfortunately, I won't have time for questions, I see. I have one minute left. But you can use Try APL online. There are some tutorials there. There's a bunch of videos. Um, if you're a student, it's free. And note that every year we run a competition for students where the prize is thousands of dollars and a trip to our user conference paid by us. Uh, and there's a low cost, it's usually 50 pounds, $75, uh, non-commercial version. But if you register for that within the next week and say you were here, then just ignore the, the payment instructions. I had a lot of help putting this together. Uh, and I apologize to these guys for running out of time and not using their material to its fullest extent. Um, I thank you all for listening. I do have a slide which says any questions. But uh, I, there is no time. But I'll just so I'll just remind you that uh, the definition of question mark is is this. So we'll have to take the questions in the breaks, or you know, fill in the forms and say we want them back next year for a, a slower talk on APL, and I'll be very happy to do that. Thank you for listening.
another 15 minutes.